Shall we start? Yes, please uh, start immediately. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. First of all, uh, thank you very much, Valeria, for organizing this this online meeting. Uh, also for inviting me. It's obviously a pleasure for me to be here, and I'm also very happy to see so many friends on the screen. Uh, so that's it's really it's really nice. And um, the second thing that I, I want to say is that uh, this is probably the the my first steps in this new uh, research that I I am I am uh, I am on right now. Uh, this I I started with 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 the study of symmetries in metaphysics and in philosophy of physics in October at uh, the thesis. So pretty much of what I'm going to say here is just my first intuition about uh, the philosophical role or the metaphysical role that uh, symmetries can play uh, in metaphysical explanation, but also in philosophy of physics. And uh, what kind of things we can learn about the world, about the, our reality when we look at uh, the symmetries. Uh, so I, 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 what I, I really I really want is that we, we, we can have a good discussion because I, I want to test my ideas with you. So please, if you have any comment, criticism or whatever, just bring it up. My idea is, is that you try to, to that you try to convince me that if, whether I'm on the right track or I should step back and take a different path. So uh, this is the, the, the title of the presentation. And um, one general, a probably humble, uh, aim of the presentation is to merely assess the role that symmetries may play in metaphysical explanation and physics physics theorizing. As you know, as you probably know, uh, in the last years, many metaphysicians have found the idea of symmetries as very interesting and a very naturalistic tool to investigate what the world is like, what are the, the properties of the space-time, what is the natural properties that we can find out there. So symmetries seem to have this, this, uh, this force to involve in many metaphysical discussion and to try to say something new in our traditional metaphysical discussion. So I, I would try to assess that. This is the general probably humble aim of the presentation. And a more particular, probably bolder uh, aim is try to uh, focus on a particular uh, attitude or particular approach to symmetry that I will call symmet symmetry fundamentalism or symmetry realism. I will uh, swing back and forth between these two notions because I, I'm not still uh, very convinced about what's the specificity of, of each of them. But the, the, the points that I would try to argue or give some, some hints about I think that uh, this, this attitude is another right the right one to uh, construe the role that symmetries could play in metaphysics, but also in, in physics in general. Uh, and the, the, the other part of the argumentation would be that I would suggest that probably something like symmetry deflationism is a more appropriate approach, mainly for ontological and theoretical reasons. I'm, I'm not saying that, uh, that, I mean, this is the, the, the properly philosophical part of it. We as philosophers or metaphysicians should do with this idea of symmetries. I would recommend that you, we should pursue something like symmetry deflationism and uh, cast, cast some doubt on symmetry fundamentalism or symmetry realism. This is more or less the, the, the aims of the presentation. And this is the, the map, uh, very, very brief. Um, I, will, I will try to go through the first two parts very quickly. So, because I, I want to focus on the on the third part, what is my proposal, or my 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 doubts or my my main arguments. But be, before to to get at the presentation properly, I, I would like to say something broader about what what my what is my my approach in general. Because it, I mean, you can focus on the concept of symmetries and try to elaborate. Uh, philosophical interpretation of symmetries. But what I, I would like to do is something that go beyond the notion of symmetries and to see how that notion plays a role in a broader philosophical system. And I think that this, 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 
these uh, words by sellers are very, very uh, stimulating in this sense, because what we want to understand as philosophers is try to see how things hang together. So I, I would have to see how symmetries hang together with other notions that we usually um, study in, in, in philosophy of physics, but also in metaphysics, for example, the notion of law, the notion of theory, the notion of models, and so on and so forth. So for, to my mind, the, the notion of symmetry can only make sense if we try to see how it works in a broader uh, philosophical system in relation to the notion of law, in relation to the notion of theory, in relation to the notion of idealizations, and so on and so forth. So this is the, the spirit that is, is guiding this presentation, if, 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 you, if you want. So the, the, the first part, I, this is probably the, 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 the boring part because, I mean, uh, there's a lot of, of formal details and formal discussion, theoretical discussion that I don't really want to get into here, but just to get a common understanding of what a symmetry is, probably if you are not familiarized with the notion in physics, this is something like this. We, 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 we can start giving, we, we, we can, yeah, we can start giving a formal definition of a symmetry. First, I, I would say that as symmetries, even, I mean, first, first, uh, First, first side point. The notion of symmetry is quite complex and people understand different things about symmetries. You have dynamical symmetries, space and symmetries, internal symmetries, external symmetries, gauge symmetries, blah, blah, and all of them are different, but also people understand differently the notion, for example, of dynamical symmetry. Some people relate dynamical symmetries with gauge symmetries, but other people say that dynamical symmetries are just symmetries that are predicated of law. So, I, I would just use the notion of symmetry in general. Probably this, some of this point uh, is not quite exact if, we, if you take a particular notion of symmetry, but it's just to try to generate a common uh, understanding of, what, of what, what we are talking about. So first, I would say that one of the features, even a formal feature of symmetries, is that they are defined by their symmetry transformation. You formally define a transformation over a uh, space, for example, and this transformation uh, does something, transform things in a particular way. And how this transformation transforms things in a particular way is the symmetry that you are going to get. Second, uh, again, this, from this very uh, formal definition, uh, symmetry transformations mainly apply upon formal structures. And pragmatically, I would say that these formal structures are those given by dynamical equations. So we define a symmetry transformation and we apply the symmetry transformation to dynamical equation, that is formal structure. And we have to see how the elements within the structure transform under the symmetry transformation. So I would say that it's fair to say that symmetries are at least in principle, formal properties of the dynamical equations. We have some structure, the dynamical equation. If we apply the transformation and we see what happens, and what happens is the property the dynamical equation has. And this property could be further spelled out in terms of being invariant. When we transform the structure, we see if the structure remains invariant after applying the transformation. A uh, more formal definition uh, is, is, is this one, but basically it says what I already said before, that we have some structure in this case, a dynamical equation, we have some elements within this structure, could be uh, states, it could be observables, we, we could be differential operator or external parameters, whatever, and we define a transformation that, that something transform the states in a particular way, transform the observables in a particular way, transform the differential operators in a particular way, and so on and so forth. And then we, get, we, we get a second structure that is a, the, the symmetry transformed structure. And we just compare if the original structure remains invariant under the, 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 after applying the symmetry transformation. So far, so good. I mean, I think that is not quite problematic because we are just 
manipulating symbols in some way. Oh, but, but we, we can go a step further and say something like, under a more semantic or even model theoretic definition of symmetries, when we do something like this, we, when we do something like manipulating symbols in a particular way, we are doing something like also transforming, for example, solutions of the dynamical equation into solutions of the dynamical equation. So we are preserving somehow the space of solutions of, uh, of an equation. Going even uh, a step further, we can say that symmetries preserve the truth of the law, that which is represented by the dynamical equation. So if we accept that, uh, for example, some law is represented fairly by a dynamical equation, and that dynamical equation um, remains invariant under, under some symmetry transformation, we see that all that what, what, what happens is that the truth of the law has been also preserved. So the, the, the truth of the law is also valid in other possible words, for example. And I, this is just more or less the same, but in a more specific way. B basically, what, what this uh, definition tried to, to say is that asymmetry preserves the models of, of the theory. In the sense that we are transforming models into models. We are preserving the space of models of the theory. In this edge, we can then define a notion of true, we can define a notion of uh, possibility and necessity and so on and so forth. But basically, this is what we generally understand by this very general, general notion of symmetry. Then, as I said before, we have more specific notion, more specific symmetries that, that act in a particular way, and there are more problems there. But in general, I would say that uh, symmetries work more or less in, in this sense. OK, so we have this first uh, formal or uh, partially interpreted notion of symmetries. But now the philosophy comes in in this following sense. This notion of symmetry has, be, has been found to be, for some reason, that we are, we are trying to discover interesting for many philosophers because we can, we can extract from, 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 from them some philosophical claims. So when we see that we are manipulating these these symbols and we we find that the, some theory is invariant under I know time reversal is invariant under space rotation is invariant under permutation. Well, from from there, from this 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 manipulation of symbols and also this this partially interpreted notion of what that we are doing when manipulating the symbols, we can say something more, something more interesting about what the world is like. And this is what I, I would call a philosophical claim. We can say, well, if an invariant asymmetry holds in this theory, this means something about the world, about the notion of law, about our ontology, about the structure of space-time, for example. But what we have to first be aware of here is that there is some inferential mechanism that goes from symmetry to this philosophical claim. So one of the first things we, we, we should do is try to be clear about what is the inferential mechanism that is operating to, to take us from one point and leaving us in the other. But, but to, to give you some examples about what, what I'm, I'm saying, for example, this is a Hugh, Hugh Price book about the arrow of time. So we are investigating something about whether uh, our world comes equipped with a direction of time, for example. This could, I would say that is a, probably a philosophical question. And uh, one of the things that Price says here is it's not that he's defending this dispute, but he's, he's capturing what other people uh, says about about this is that to a very large extent then the loss of physics seems to be blind to the direction of time they satisfies the time reversal symmetry as we may say so the idea is that because the laws are time reversal symmetric or time reversal invariant 
we can say something about the direction of time. We can say something about the structure of time in our in our world. So this is a case in which symmetries seems to be playing this role of giving us some information, some relevant information about about the world. This is much more uh, complete explanation of what of how how this this inferential mechanism is working. This is a uh, Gene North in a very nice paper about the notion of time reversal again. But what he says, well, what she says here is that in applying any transformation to a theory, any symmetry transformation, we hope to learn about the symmetry of the theory and of the world that the theory describes. If a theory remains the same after the transformation, there is is invariant under the transformation, then we say that it's symmetric under that operation. We conclude that a world described by the theory lacks the structure that would be needed to support an asymmetry under the operation. And I think this is the when this is a clear example of, of what is, is going on here. For example, from the space translation invariance of the laws, this is the, the formal part. We formally show that the laws of this theory are space translation invariant. We can infer that space is homogeneous. There is there is no preferred location in space. Again, this is could look like a metaphysical thing. We are saying something about the physical space from a result that we obtain uh, in the in the formal part of our theory, from discovering that the theories that the, the laws were uh, space transition in part. But this is one, one, one way in which we can, we can see this uh, inferential mechanism work in philosophy of physics, but also in metaphysics. But we can go either, we can go, go even uh, beyond this by postulating that symmetries are not just one thing that somehow take us from uh, a formal property to some property of the world, but somehow symmetries are aspect of the world, from the fundamental aspect of the world. And this is what I, I, I have called, but also uh, Schrenen has called uh, symmetry fundamentalism, in the sense that symmetries, again, are fundamental aspects of physical reality, where the physical entities, for example, particles or fields, come after or depend on, ontologically depend on, the notion of symmetry. So now we are we, we, we are not just manipulating symbols when we discover that some theory is invariant under some transformation. We are discovering a fundamental aspect of the world, a fundamental structure in the world that, again, is playing some role in a broader uh, philosophical framework, for example, state, state space first view or state, state space substantivalism. But the point is, is, is clear that now symmetries play some ontological role that is much heavier than just manipulating ma man manipulating symbols in our physical theories. And more or less, the same can be can be read in a French book, The Structure of the World. Uh, I, I'm not going to read it completely, but what he says is that laws and symmetries should be considered as features and fundamental features of the structure of the world in a world where we don't have any entities, but all we have is some structure, laws, and symmetries. Again, a case of symmetry fundamentalism. So we have two different sort of theses, more or less on the, on the same boat. One of them postulating that uh, symmetries are somehow real in the sense that they can represent or guide us to ontological features. We are not really commitment. Sorry, we are not really committed to the idea that symmetries are fundamental, are fundamental structure in the world. But somehow they should be real in order to help us to discover uh, fundamental entities, uh, fundamental structures, or, or these kind of things. I would say that people that, for example, take the notion of time reversal invariance very seriously, and then they say something about the direction of time. Well, they are somehow taking symmetry realism into consideration as they think that something in the world guides us to discover that there is no direction of time because 
asymmetry, uh, time reverse asymmetry uh, uh, holds in our physical theories. Or we can say, as I said before, this second position that assumes some assumes a symmetry realism, but go further in the sense that symmetries now are fundamental, are really part of the building blocks of reality. So this is the the the, the two uh, I would say that two parts of a say of the same same uh, movement that try to to um, to see symmetries are playing a serious metaphysical role and should play a serious metaphysical role in our philosophical systems, either by postulating symmetries as somehow somehow real or symmetries are as fundamental. So let me briefly see what what what, what is the argument behind behind this. What is this inferential mechanism working? To, to take something at the formal level and then to say something about, about the world. So, in general, when, when we have a, a symmetry, we, we, we should specify what is the, the, the formal structure upon which we are applying the symmetry. For example, the laws. So we postulate that there are some laws that govern our, our world. And then when we apply the symmetry to, to this structure, we identify in general some property could be a magnitude and observable and state that can change freely without changing the overall structure of the law. For example, we can change freely velocities, we can change freely the direction of time, but the structure of the law is the same. So we identify this, uh, this variant feature, this variant property when we are uh, working with symmetries in this still formal level. So we have in this in the argumentation this these first two premises are mainly formal in the sense that they are just saying that asymmetry holds in this formal structure. But then if, if we want to, to extract from the from from, from need a uh, philosophical conclusion, we need philosophical premises, we need some something more than just mathematics. So we need to interpret philosophically what means that a feature can vary freely. What means that I can change the sign of, the, of, of t of the parameter of the time parameter in our physical theory, and then the the, the structure remains the same. I have to give some philosophical interpretation about this, and then I have to postulate some epistemic constraint, saying that well, it's not uh, epistemic advisable to take this variant feature seriously in our ontology. And then, okay, I can I can conclude that because all these premises, I can say, well, the property is not real. So the symmetry we start with took us to a philosophical result by saying that, well, we shouldn't take this feature seriously. Obviously, the the the, the tricky part is the part in which we have to in, in, yeah we have to give an interpretation of what means that. We have some some property in our in our equation that can change freely. What does it mean? And there is a, a lot of ongoing discussion about how this should be interpreted. For example, uh, uh, Shamik, Shamik Dasgupta says that well, what means that asymmetry holds that we we find this uh, variant feature? Well, we are saying that uh, f is this this property is unobservable because it's unobservable we we should just take it up from our uh, our ontology for example or we can say that f is part of a superfluous structure like dirac or ismail van frasen have argued or we can say that probably ontologically more more ontologically heavier that this uh, variant feature that we discovered by the symmetry is non-objective. So that's why we should uh, remove it from our ontological commitment. For example, Nozick and Valia Alori have, have, have said something along the, the, this line. Or we can even say that F of this, this property is non-fundamental. These are just different ways to show you how it's not, it's not a straightforward path from symmetries to a philosophical claim. We should do a lot of philosophical work in the middle 
to fill the premises with philosophical premises, with some interpretation to say, well, the symmetry that I discovered in my in my physical theory by manipulating symbols, then it has uh, some some interest, interesting uh, interesting claim about about the world. Something like this, I think that is 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 going on in in this interpretation. What what is the the the, the one of the options that I see in this uh, general argument? One is that there is this assumption somehow that we must take symmetries metaphysically seriously because they can guide us to uncover fundamental structure, natural properties, uh, the, some properties of the space time and so on. That, 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 that's why we, we place the symmetries in the argumentation as playing the role of triggering the interpretation and then triggering the philosophical conclusion. And that now I, I would say two things that I'm not completely sure about this. So please be, bear in mind these two claims, and we can discuss it after af, afterward. But I, I see that the argumentation, in some sense, need needs to play the symmetries somehow in the in the real world. They can guide us because they are somehow real, even even though they are not fundamental, even though they are. They might be not fundamental. They might be you no know, entities or real structure. They at least should be instantiated by real uh, stuff in the world. Otherwise, I don't see the connection from uh, from the symmetries to the philosophical claim about about the world. But this is not something I'm not completely sure. But probably this is one of my first intuition. Uh, well, okay, well, by symmetry realism is assumed by symmetry fundam fundamentalism. Symmetry realism is committed to the idea that symmetries are somehow real, and because are, they are somehow real, they can help us to discover new structures or new entities or new properties. But it's not committed to the idea that symmetries themselves are uh, fundamental. Symmetry fundamentalism accept obviously that symmetries are real, but they add that symmetries are part of the fundamental structure of the world. So this is just to give you the big picture of what is the, you know, the very general notion of symmetries. I, I'm mainly thinking of these uh, space and symmetries like time reversal, space translation, space rotation, uh, blah, blah, blah. Then we have some people that think that we should, we, we can do Good metaphysics from from this, we can discover, we can give an answer to a serious metaphysical question about what is the world like, what is the structure of space, what is the structure of time, whether time is directed or not, and so and they they have tried to convince us that this is a useful tool through something like the argument that I said before. Now, when I, when I start to think in this argue, in this kind of argumentation, at the beginning I think that it was quite right. I mean, should be looks like a interesting idea, also with a, uh, a very convincing idea. But but then when I start to think to think these things through, I start to have some caveats. And what I, I want to share with you is some of these caveats. And this is probably the first step, steps towards something like symmetry deflationism. Symmetry deflationism try to, to see symmetries as not playing a metaphysical serious role in our uh, understanding of the, of, of, of the world, of the physical world. So what, one, one of the first points I want to, to, to raise is the uh, attention that I, I found in the literature about symmetries and it's this tension about whether symmetries are stipulated or are, are discovered. I, 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 I have called them in, the, in this way, but basically the, the idea is that when we are formulating our physical theories, we stipulate previously that the theory must be symmetric under some transformation or it happens that we build our theory and then we find that the theory comes out uh, symmetric under some transformation. 
so I I I I, I was uh, running through the literature and both sides seem to be fairly represented in the in physics in general, even though some of these approaches is more contemporary to us, but in general, these two sides are somehow there. For example, uh, this is uh, this in, in, in this book, uh, uh, Dürer and Teufel tra are trying to to build a, a theory of quantum mechanics, moving mechanics. So they are doing real real physics in the sense that they are trying to to uh, to be clear about the, the, the principles and the dynamics of the theory, the definition of states, and so on and so forth. At, at some point, they talk about the symmetries of the theory. And what they say, what the, the, the assumption that they, they take into account is the following. They claim that a, a symmetry can be a priori, in the sense that the physical law is built in such a way that it respects that particular symmetry by construction. And this is a clear case of the space and symmetries, in the sense that we first build the rules of the theater, the symmetries, we, we say how the space time should be, how the structure of time should be. We do this by imposing some symmetries a priori, how, how they, they, they say, and then after doing that, we build the dynamics according to the, to the laws, to the rules of the, of the theater. So in this sense, it's look pretty much like the symmetries are stipulated a priori. It's not that thing that I have some law and then while I'm digging to the law, I discover that the law is symmetric. It's the other way around. First, I say that the theory is symmetric, the law is symmetric, and then uh, and then I, I, I have the right dynamics for that symmetry. A similar case, I mean, it's not quite, it's, it's in the same boat, but it's on the same boat, but it's not similar, but more or less represents the same idea is that, for example, the discussion about time reversal in classical electromagnetism by Frank Arsenius and Hilary Greaves. They, they are discussing about whether, about how to build the right time reversal transformation in classical electromagnetism. And what they bring up in this in this book is what they call the the standard the textbook account and the textbook account to give the right tra similar transformation is to start start of assuming that the, the the theory is invariant under time reversal so we, we, we need to figure out how it's the what, 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 is, what are the features of the symmetry transformation? So in order to do this, we first stipulate that the theory must be uh, symmetric under time reversal. When we postulate, stipulate that the theory should be symmetric under time reversal, then we can figure out what are the right properties that the symmetry transformation should have in order to keep the theory invariant. So uh, I'm seeing in, in, in this, in this sort of explanation more or less the same as before. We start with the postulation that the symmetry should be met and then we figure out in this case the the time present transformation. But now to give you a different approach, I mean this is quite long. I mean the the nice quote I found is quite long but I just extract the, this this briefer briefer part. But this is John Ehrman in, a, I think, 2002 or 2000, 2004 uh, paper about symmetries. And he, he, he already uh, notes that there are at least two different approaches to symmetries. What, what, what I showed before is the a priori approach. But what he says is that the received wisdom about the status of symmetry principle principle has it that one must confront a choice between the a posteriori approach versus the a priori approach. The previous cases seem to, be, seem, seem to fit into a more a priori approach. So what is the a posteriori approach? The posterior approach is what I, I call the by discovery approach. And one of the best examples, one is, is in Newton, but this is 
thanks to Alexander that gave me the quote before, but I think that this is really perfect. This is about Lagrange. And Lagrange thought that the symmetry principles along with the cons conservation principle must be viewed as general results of the laws of the dynamics rather than fundamental principles of this science. So this is the opposite, opposite movement. We, we don't start with the symmetries of the theory. We don't start by stipulating the symmetries of the theory. We start with a empirically adequate dynamics, and then when we are investigating formally or even empirically the dynamics, we discover that there are some symmetries. So first, this is the this tension. This tension is, I think, in the literature that I, I, I separate in this two sides, the by stipulation and the by discovery. The by stipulation seems to suggest that a symmetry, in this case, I took the dynamical symmetry in the sense that a symmetry that is applied up, upon a law must be regarded as a priori, in the sense that we, we can come to know it by no empirical means, just by postulating a priori that it should be the case, and, 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 that, and that's all. But also, is that the case, it's necessary for a theory dynamics. A particular theory, let, let's say uh, Hamiltonian mechanics, Lagrangian mechanics, must be uh, a priori and necessarily time reversal invariant, space rotation invariant, and so on and so forth. Otherwise, we are talking about a different theory. So it's a necessary feature of the theory to be invariant under some transformation because it's the way in which we build the, the dynamics. The discovery approach is completely opposite in the sense that we discover the symmetry a posteriori, in the sense that we discover the symmetry once we have the dynamics, but also it's contingent. We can have a theory that could be non time reversal invariant, non space rotation invariant, for example. There is no necessity in the theory to be in such a way. Could be different. Obviously, the, the, the word a priori, a posteriori, contingent, contingent, unnecessary is much more complicated. So I'm trying to give you the, the brief answer. But more or less, this is the, the, the spirit of, of what, what I want to say. So when, when we, we look into the, each of these approaches, we see that the by stipulation approach seems to be playing a more heuristic role, guiding theory construction, in the sense that it's helping us to build the dynamics. In, contra, in, con, in contrast, the by discovery approach at least seems to be partially based on world features, in the sense that we have some empirical uh, adequate laws, and then we discover that these laws have some features. So one could say, well, there's something in the laws that was built independently of the symmetries that reflect the symmetry somehow. When, but when, one of the of the of the of the results of the, of this tension is that the first approach, the bistipulation approach, is much more common in the current physics in current physics that was before. Before in the 19th century physics, uh, like. I know, like Lagrange, but also before that, Newton thought that symmetries are by discovery. Now it seems to be that physics, uh, that symmetries are stipulated. And this is something that uh, Bradin and Castellani in this uh, very famous book about symmetries explicitly say that after uh, relativity, physicists seem to move onto a uh, by stipulation view of symmetries, even though they didn't, they don't call it in that way, but it captured pretty well what is the idea. So, what what is the my 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 caveats about this? If it's true that current physics implies some sort of by stipulation view, how should we interpret symmetry fundamentalism or even symmetry realism? Now, if if, you, if we look at the previous argument, one of the one of the main premises that say that a symmetry holds are now just a stipulation. A stipulation by heuristic reason or whatever, but there are stipulation that is, is, is made before we can even get a right dynamics. So if we think that symmetries are fundamental structure 
uh, of the world, for example. Uh, I, this is a bit confusing for me in the sense that if they are stipulated, but then they represent somehow, or they are somehow fundamental structure, we should say that these fundamental structure are a priori also stipulated. It's the case that we are somehow doing a kind of a priori metaphysics. And also in which way oh, may we come to uncover fundamental structure structures through a priori stipulations? Where this stipulation come from? Uh, when, when, when I ask this question to uh, to Sheldon Goldstein, in, in when say about Boyan mechanics precisely, he told me something that is, was very interesting, but also that shows that there's something more going on if you, if you take this seriously. Because they start with the idea that we live in a sort of a platonic space time, in the sense that space time should be metaphysically, because we are platonist, perfectly, perfectly isomorphic firstly homogeneous and so on. So with this idea in mind, we impose the idea that some symmetries should be should 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 be uh, present in our theories. But again, what, what, what is playing the metaphysical role now is that we are assuming previously that space-time, for example, or time or the properties of our world should be in some particular way. And then the symmetry just try to recover this idea. But again, this look, looks pretty much like a priori metaphysics somehow. So but my, 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 first, my first problem is that I don't see how symmetry realism or symmetry fundamentalism can, can deal with the idea that symmetries are stipulated, stipulated prior to the dynamics. This is the, 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 the first point. For, 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 from this, it follows a second point that also is, is puzzling for me. In many, many cases, I would say that the majority of cases, but you can correct me afterwards if you think that I'm wrong, um, symmetries are properties of fundamental and general equations. That is, equations in which we, ha we have abstract away many, for example, non-conservative forces, many interactions. So we have this very general equation, for example, the free fall equation. And we say that, for example, uh, time reversal invariance, space rotation, or space rotation uh, are properties of these dynamical equations, of these general equations. But again, this, this general equation, these fundamental equations are usually given by highly idealized models. Models in which, for example, we have a uh, got rid of friction. We got we have got rid of uh, air. We have got rid of, of uh, elastic bodies. Something like like this. So we stipulate that these very general equations that gives us very highly idealized models are symmetric. But now that so far so good in the sense that again we are we have this structure this structure give us some some models for example the free fall the free fall particles in one case and we discover that well in that in those cases asymmetry holds it's true that you should take the coming and even classical Newtonian classical mechanics an equation and particle moving in a straight line in an empty space is time reversal invariant period, it's, it's true, it's completely true. But then, but then I, I, I ask myself, is there any reason to take such, such equations or such idealized models ontologically seriously? What we should read off from this, on this highly idealized model? And I think that we, we can go two ways, basically. <laughs> we can say that these general equations just are describing highly idealized models that shouldn't be given any ontological privilege. I mean, this is just part of our way to represent the world, but they are not really representing nothing in the reality. When I, when I say that uh, if I if I get rid of any if I get rid of uh, inhomogeneous fields, 
if I get rid of, of air, I, I'm getting rid of, uh, I don't know, uh, friction whatsoever when I have uh, some symmetries in, in my, my physical theory. But the question is, why should I take that this particular model is really unfairly representing the world in which we live in? Why should I say that the world we live, we live in is symmetric because this particular model is symmetric? This one, 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 one way we, we can go. The other way is to say that, well, actually, these general equations and these uh, highly idealized models are really representing the fundamental reality. What we are seeing is not the fundamental reality. We are seeing uh, emerging or ap apparent reality. But if we want to investigate the world into the fundamental level, we should pay attention to these highly idealized models because they, they are giving us the structure of the world as it is at bottom. So in some sense, they are playing an ontological, an ontological role and that's why symmetry should be given a, an, should be taken metaphysically seriously because they are giving us information about the world at this fundamental level by assuming that this fundamental level is fairly represented by this highly idealized equation. This discussion, I mean, I, I, I saw this discussion in a, a bit older, a bit old papers about the direction of time in classical mechanics, about Hutchinson and calendar. Hutchinson saying that obviously classical mechanics is non terminal invariant because we have friction, we have imperfect springs, we have uh, non-rigid bodies and so on and so forth. Calendar say that he's just uh, missing the point because when what we are asking a philosophical question about the arrow of time, for example, we shouldn't take, for example, conservative forces seriously. We shouldn't take friction seriously. We shouldn't take imperfect spring seriously. What we should take seriously is this highly idealized model. So, uh, again, I think that even though, I mean, we, we, we can go both ways, but still for me, we, we need some further argumentation to say that why a highly idealized model is ontologically or is metaphysically more important than a model uh, that is more fairly representing the world in which we live in. I mean, I, I, I don't have the answer. My, I, I, am, I am prone to be with Hutchison in the discussion and to say that, to say, hang on, uh, probably we are just overloading metaphysically highly idealized models. We are overloading the meaning of this general equation and they shouldn't be taken seriously. But I think I'm, I'm open to rethink these issues again because of it. I'm not really sure, but in general, I would say that this is a problem we have to deal with when we are uh, discussing about symmetries, because symmetries in the overwhelming majority of cases are properties of dynamical equations that are quite general, that give us very highly idealized models. So this is a problem that I think that we should some we should pay some some attention to. So this is the second step general equations and highly less model and what, what, what my, my, my intuition is that that people that take symmetries uh, seriously in a metaphysics are somehow refine this general equation on this highly less model they are trying to say trying to say as calendars for example that well the, the this equation these idealized models are doing something more than just representing um, uh, representing uh, very general ideas or very uh, abstraction. They are capturing some structure in the world. And now the third and final step, and I think that I'm, I'm over after after this, is that um, I, 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 I started by pointing out that one of the, one of the feature of symmetries is that they are properties of the laws. 
in general, we, we, we apply symmetries to laws mainly. Uh, even though if we take they as stipulated or, or not, this is independent. In, in both cases, they are properties of, it, of some dynamics. So my question is that there is some sense in which if we take symmetries as real or even more as fundamental, do we require in our ontological system a robust view of laws? It's, it's not still completely clear to me, but it seems, it seems that somehow symmetry realism or symmetry fundamentalism implies a realist view of laws. When, when, when I think in, 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 for example, humanism of laws or dispositionalism, I'm not completely sure that we can make straightforwardly the step from the symmetries to the reality because now the symmetries are instantiated in in things like laws that are more, much more deflated, that are of either regularities or either axioms in our web system or are something that we can extract from these positions. But now it's not clear how these two views can accommodate symmetries as real or fundamental. So this is why I think that symmetry, realism, fundamentalism uh, somehow is committed to the idea of realism about laws. Obviously, if someone is not happy with symmetry realism or symmetry fundamentalism, one way to go is, well, let's go and reject realism about laws. So if I'm not happy with the idea that symmetries are real, that symmetries are fundamental, I can go with humanism about laws, or I can go with disposition dispositionalism. And then we are just by model, model students rejecting symmetry realism and symmetry fundamentalism. So I, I'm not saying that this is bad per, per se, but what I'm saying is that this, this seems to be a, a hidden assumption in, in those uh, defending symmetry realism or symmetry fundamentalism. So this is uh, an additional commitment that they, they, I think, should take in order to make, make sense to the idea that symmetries can be somehow real or can be somehow fundamental. So this very, very briefly, the role to symmetry deflationism. First, the by stipulation approach. I think that, well, I mean, this is just the way in which physicists use symmetries. So I think that so, something that we should accept when we are trying to philosophically elucidate the notion of symmetry, well, we can accept that they are playing this rule prescribing role heuristically guiding theory construction. This is something that we can we can accept and I think that we should accept. But as I said before, there seems to be some commitment with taking highly idealized models seriously. And we can obviously reject this. If if we take something like a best system approach or we can a more human approach, we can easily say that it's obvious that this particular particular laws are not recovering any irregularity, but are just playing a representational role, trying to uh, capture in the, most sim in the simplest and most informative way those regularities, for example. So there is one way in which we can reject one of these assumptions. And the second one is more or less the same, rejecting realism about laws. So uh, in this, in, in this sense, uh, by rejecting this, uh, these last two assumptions that I, I see that symmetry realism or symmetry fundamentalism is committed to, we can reach something like symmetry deflationism. And basically what symmetry deflationism, deflationism uh, says is that symmetries play a heuristic role in the representation and systematization of our physical theories, but they neither guide us to the basic ontology nor are part of the basic ontology. The basic ontology should be worked out independently of the symmetries because this is not the part in our representation that is playing an ontological role. In a sense, symmetries should be just 
properties of the representational apparatus, of the way in which we, we encoded information about the world, but it's not nothing in the reality itself. Um, so any problem that we have about symmetries, about if, whether a theory is symmetric under some transformation, is just a problem about representation. It's a problem about which is the best way in which we can encode information about the world, but it's not a problem about with, with, which sort of entities exist in our world or which, which sort of entities doesn't exist in our world, or it also it has nothing to do with the structure of the world. This is something that should be worked out independently by ontological uh, reasoning, by ontological investigation, but it's not the, the symmetries that are gonna, uh, are gonna uh, give us some um, some light or are, are gonna give us some hints about the, 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 this structure. Because once again, they seem to be just playing a, a role in the way in which we construct theories, in which we, uh, uh, we construct the dynamics in the most uh, efficient and the most informative and the simplest way. But obviously we, we, we can think differently. We can think that it's not the role of theories to, to, to do this. But we, we, when we can go with a more dispositionalist view, but in that case as well, I think symmetries shouldn't be playing a, at least a fundamental role because they should be so as uh, emerging from, for example, powers or dispositions, and not from something in the in the in the fundamental reality itself. So I think that this is all. Yeah, thank you for listening. Okay, uh, so let's continue now. Uh, we have, uh, I hope everybody has withdrawn. Mm, so we have uh, four persons uh, uh, who want to say something. I, sorry, I don't know in which order they, um, they uh, who was the, the second and so on, but I know that Nuria was the first, so let's start with her, and then I just proceed in the way I, in the order I see the, um, the alphabetic order, I hope you don't mind. So Nuria, please uh, begin. Okay, thanks. And thanks, Christian, for the talk. And thanks, of course, Valeria, for organizing. And, and everyone. we don't hear uh, you. Uh, do you have your mi microphone activated? Uh, yeah, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing her. Yeah. I, I don't. Could, could you begin again? Yes. yes. Do, do everyone else hears me? Yes. Yes. I don't hear Nuria. Uh, if others hear, well, it's still. Christian, do you hear Nuria? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm hearing her perfectly. Okay, that's weird. <laughs> um, I was saying that thank you, Christian, for the talk and everyone, um, and also Valeria for organizing. Yeah, okay, okay, now, now I hear, yeah, please uh, continue, sorry. <laughs> and um, yeah, I wanted to ask you two brief questions. Uh, um, I really liked uh, this idea of um, symmetry deflationism, but you just mentioned it very briefly in the end. Um, and so I wanted to have a bit more context on this idea, like who proposed this idea or like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, is, does it, is it in the literature or like what are the authors who proposed it and, and to solve which problems? Um, is it something that you have taken to solve um, other kinds of problems or yeah, a bit of context on the idea. Um, and also especially because I find it to be useful maybe to uh, think about a way of this demystifying uh, the concept of spontaneous symmetry breaking, maybe, which uh, sometimes has been used uh, in order to propose some strong emergentist positions um, 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 uh, related to, to um, specific uh, um, phenomena of symmetry breaking. So, yeah, I would want to hear. Okay, uh, many thanks for, 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 for the questions. Um, as to the first one. Um, I mean, I, I, for sure, someone else has already proposed this idea. I mean, obviously, I, I, I don't know. Uh, what, what, what I can say is that um, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm pushing forward this idea based on, for example, some discussion and some papers that I, I, I read by uh, David Wallace, for example, it was a 2019 paper, a couple of papers about symmetries. Uh, even though the, he he doesn't really speak of uh, symmetry deflationism or or the connection between uh, the, the symmetries and laws and all, all this stuff, 
he seems to, to, to suggest that when we are working on symmetries, mainly in, 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 in physical theories, where we are just taking a subsystem from a larger system, we are doing a lot of idealizations, and it's not clear how, uh, what uh, ontological role can play symmetries in that context. But also, I mean, I think that uh, Maria Alexander knows this better than me, but Gordon Bellet also have, has cast some doubts on the idea that symmetries can uh, play this ontological role. So, I mean, I am probably just uh, trying to uh, systemat systematize these this intuitions or these ideas, but this label of symmetry deflationism. And the, the context is that, um, um, probably the context is, is better, better understood in metaphysics of science when we have this, these uh, arguments in favor of uh, uh, no direction of time, uh, no or certain ontological properties or certain kind of stuff based on symmetries. And for example, I, all this started with, with my PhD thesis about the error of time. And one of the main arguments for uh, eliminating the error of time is time present invariant. But I like time, so I want to preserve time. So my, my first strategy was try to dismantle the idea of time reversal symmetry. And I found these this intuitions there. and. I thought that probably it's the same case with the rest of the symmetries. Probably we can just take it and say, well, uh, probably we are taking uh, these symmetries metaphysically too seriously, and we should just expose the intuition and premises that are working in there. But um, yeah, I, I would say that. But so also, can, yeah. So sorry, uh, Christian. I just uh, see that we have like 40 minutes left for everything. Okay. So I would just ask you to uh, to answer briefly and to those persons who ask questions to also ask them briefly if it's possible, please. Okay, it's it's very hard to me to be to be to be short, but I, I would try to do my best. So this is the the, the, the first answer. The, the second answer, uh, the, the, the the honest answer, and the short answer is I don't know. I I didn't I didn't have to. I, I didn't. I didn't thought. I didn't think ab about that. About the spontaneous symmetry breaking and how this fits together. So, in, in for the sake of being brief and <coughs> honest, I would say, I don't know. Probably you're right. <laughs> nice. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I suggest that we go to another question. Uh, so, Vasily Sekulario, uh, please uh, ask your question. Yes, th thanks very much for this talk. It was a very rich talk and it raised uh, millions of questions. Now I'll try to be brief. I have <clears throat> I have a remark to make. Um, uh, if we take theories of physics, we're talking about symmetries. These, are, these symmetries refer to transformations and these transformations form groups. So when we talk about symmetries, we talk about symmetry groups. Now, the axioms defining a group structure mathematically are the algebraic or geometrical expression of the logical of the logical properties of the notion of identity. They correspond one to one to the three uh, characteristics, uh, the three properties of identity. So, so mm -hmm. having a symmetry means that something, a system, is changing while at the same time preserves some essential aspects of its identity. Uh, and these correspond to, to conserved uh, magnitudes, for example. So uh, to have a symmetry seems to be a fundamental first step in articulating a theory about the system. If you know what kind of system you're going to, to examine, then you formulate a theory that incorporates the symmetry. If you don't know that, then you try to discover it and you look for it, but it is the benchmark of any theoretical uh, examination. It is the way to circumscribe the object of your investigation. So it's a, a condition for forming a theory. Uh, so uh, uh, this idea, if you, I mean, I don't know how you assess this idea and how it fits in your scheme and in your classification uh, that you presented. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thanks. Thanks for, for the question. It's really, really interesting. And I would try to say something so, so, something interesting as, as well. Let me try. Um, 
Yeah, uh, I mean, many of the things that you said are what I, I, I have called the, the idea of trying to build the dynamics, the, the idea of the states, the idea of what are the observables of the theory and try to identify some, for example, operator with some observables and we use all this to to build a theory, to, to guide us to build a theory. So I, I don't have any specific problem with that. I mean, it's, it's quite fine and I completely agree that symmetries play this heuristic role. My, my 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 problem, if you want, is that when we have this, then we we should talk about something out there in in the world. Because so far we we have just a formal apparatus that is partially interpreted by the by by some concepts, for example, to associate some transformation to some operators to some observables, and symmetries play some role there. But then we ha we have when we are doing more ontological work or more metaphysical work, we want to say something something else. And this is the step that I don't quite see. Let me put it an example. For example, in the case of uh, non relativistic quantum mechanics, you have the, the Galilean group. So, for example, with the Galilean group, you can figure out which operator represents which kind of things. You, 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 they conserve quantities, or you, you, ha you have all the operators, and with, with the, the Galilean symmetry transformation, you can figure out which operator corresponds to uh, momentum, which uh, angular momentum, which operator uh, corresponds to uh, energy, and so on and so forth. That is perfectly fine. But when you go to the people working on ontology of quantum mechanics, they don't just take this, this set of observables as properties in the world. Some people think that, well, I mean, they are playing a dynamical role in our theories, but it's not really representing real stuff out there. Many people are probably, I think that Davide is somewhat, some, some, somewhere there, think that, for example, the only real property that quantum system, quantum system have is positions. Okay, what, 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 and this is the ontological part of the theory. The position is the, is the, is the, is the is the main and fundamental property. And the rest of the property that my theory talk about are just playing a dynamical role, but it's just part of, of the representation of the theory, but it's not part of the ontology of the theory. I'm, I'm not saying that this is the right view. What I'm saying is that there is two steps. The step we have the symmetry at the formal level, how to, how to interpret it within the theory to build the dynamics, to build a nice theory that physically works, and symmetry is play a role there, I'm, I'm not denying that, but then we have the ontological discussion. I would say, well, this is the fundamental properties, this is the, the right structure, this is the, the of this part of the theory don't, uh, doesn't represent anything. Well, in, in, the, in that case, I don't see the, 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 the step from one side to the other. Mm. And this is what I, I'm, I'm trying to, to say that, well, let's think these things through, but I, I'm not denying that uh, the, the symmetries play a very, very, very powerful uh, uh, representational role, heuristic role in the way in which we build and understand the theory. But now, when it comes to uh, ontology or metaphysics, now I I become puzzled. Okay, uh, thank okay, you thank for you. your reply. Um, and for the question, uh, so unfortunately, uh, the person who wanted to ask this next question had to leave. Uh, so let's be brief. And uh, Peter Verde, please ask uh, the last question before we come to the last part of this talk, of this meeting. Uh, yes, thanks a lot for a great talk. Um, I was wondering about the, this idea of an uh, a priori stipulation. You mentioned this word several times, and it surprises me a little bit. Like usually we use the words a posteriori, a posteriori and a priori to point to knowledge. Uh, a stipulation cannot be knowledge because we stipulate it. It seems empty. I mean, it, it's what, well, of course, if you have results about the stipulation, logical results, that would be a priori logic, but I don't see how a stipulation as such can be knowledge. And so a priori knowledge. Um, Except in a completely trivial sense. Uh, so it's just a very concrete question. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very happy to, to say that because I completely agree with you. I mean, actually, the, the paper that I, I wrote about this, I mean, one of the previous papers with this idea, 
say something like what you are saying. So in this case, I, I try to be much simpler and try to, to, to show the main main points, but you're completely right. What, 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 what I say, what I, I say there is that I, 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 I took the term a priori and a posteriori for, for, from John Ehrman, but also from other people working on foundation of physics, like the, the book I, I showed. But it's true that a priori and a, a posteriori are epistemic terms referring to whether we know things independently of experience or not. And it seems that in the case of symmetries, it's, that's in the case. I mean, they are not a priori or a posteriori. I mean, they are a different sort of stuff. But what is true that is we think that um, a priori, quotes, prior, a priori in the sense that it comes independently of the dynamics, independently of the dynamics, in the sense that it's come prior to the dynamics. And a posteriori, it comes a post, uh, come after the, the, the dynamics. But I, I completely agree with, with, with you that it, this is a, it's, it's not a, a happy happy terms to use in these cases because it's not the right sort of thing that they are uh, a priori or a posteriori. So I, in, in this case, I was uh, I was uh, sloppy, but but I, I agree with you, and you are right. Okay, thanks. Uh, so thank you all for questions and answers. Uh, now we should move on. Uh, so, uh, Christian, I just uh, wanted to ask you uh, if you could put in the chat uh, the reference to Schronen paper. Uh, you have a reference uh, Schronen 2020. You could just put this in the chat. It would be great. Uh, okay. So uh, now thank you for this part. Um, now we have uh, around half an hour as uh, the last one. Um, I'm supposed to make a presentation. <laughs> We're supposed to have some discussion. I don't know. Uh, the meeting is officially uh, the um, like the time that Alexander has specified for the meeting was uh, till 1730. Uh, so I don't know if it will disconnect then or not. Uh, uh, so I just uh, say it, it, it won't disconnect. But we should, <laughs> should say that people are entirely free to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, in principle, you are, uh, you are uh, free to go already, so, but uh, obviously we have half an hour. So let's uh, um, do like this. I will just announce the next uh, meeting and then I will uh, do my presentation and finish it before 30 minutes. And then we see how the discussion goes in principle. If you have forces, you can stay beyond uh, 30 minutes. If you don't, then you'll just leave. Uh, Okay, so um, so the next meeting will be um, the 28th of April. Uh, we will have uh, two talks the, on the topic of counterfactuals and thought experiments. Uh, there will be Mathieu Berthelot uh, from CFSS uh, on the counterfactual side and Harada uh, Scaff uh, from Salzburg and Geneva uh, uh, on the thought experiment side. Uh, I will send uh, the announcements uh, um, sometime beforehand uh, uh, to all the lists which I'm uh, using, except uh, the Utrecht list, but they have uh, um, the full program and uh, they can contact me for the links. Uh, so those who asked me to have links for the three meetings, I will uh, send the links uh, uh, myself. If you have asked uh, the link just to these meetings, then you will need to re-ask or, or refer to my announcements uh, on other lists. Uh, so see so you maybe in uh, one uh, month, uh, in more than one month, but uh, in case you are interested, I hope you liked the meeting of today. Uh, but it's not finished. I'm just making the announcement now so that those who want to leave uh, in half an hour uh, be able to leave it without missing anything important. And then, then there will be the third meeting in, in uh, one month after the second, so the 26th of May. So there are two meetings left and uh, uh, now we are finishing with the first one. Okay, so uh, I finished with the announcements. Now I will make my presentation, and uh, I asked Alexander. I asked Alexander Gate to chair this because uh, uh, I, I will be a presenter. I, I will ask him to chair the question side. Mm, uh, so um, I will not be looking at the chat because I will now um, demonstrate my uh, screen full screen. Okay, so uh, so I will just do it in half a minute. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so let's begin with the presentation. Uh, I'm Valeria Chasova. Uh, I'm affiliated to three institutions uh, at the moment. So first there is a, a CFSS at the uh, uh, and the third there is uh, uh, 
uh, for the University of Salzburg uh, Department of Philosophy uh, for the Faculty of Cultural and uh, Social Sciences. And in between, there is the University of Strasbourg uh, Archives, and uh, so that's the institution where I was in between uh, finishing my PhD in uh, at Synthesis and uh, uh, going to Salzburg as a postdoc. And I'm still affiliated to all the three uh, research centers, uh, but as to the universities, I'm just in the, at the Salzburg University at the moment. Uh, but the affiliations from centers, you can keep it even if you are not physically at some university. Uh, is decided by the centers. So um, the topic is a gradation of empirical statuses for conservation principles. And there is no word symmetry here, but <laughs> it's uh, just uh, an appearance. Uh, so actually empirical statuses are those of symmetries and uh, symmetries are there. Uh, and our mission is on symmetries, so of course uh, my topic, my talk is on symmetries as well. Uh, and uh, um, mm -hmm. Let's go here. So, um, so, so yeah. In my in my topics, there are three terms: so the empirical statuses, conservation principles, and gradation. So I start with empirical statuses, and the uh, gradation will be at the end, and conservation principles in the middle. So empirical statuses were uh, first introduced by Kosa, Peter Kosa. Uh, in 2000, uh, he has uh, several articles of 2000, uh, one is in British Journal for the Philosophy of Science. Uh, and uh, in this one, he says, um, he introduces the distinction between direct and indirect empirical statuses of theoretical symmetries. So uh, direct empirical status is when theoretical symmetries are linked with symmetries in the world, which also calls, calls physical symmetries. So physical symmetries are, are symmetries in the world, and theoretical symmetries are symmetries in the theory. And the indirect empirical status is when uh, theoretical symmetries are linked with conservation laws. And where are these conservation laws? We will see a bit later. So both statuses are about theoretical symmetries, which are linked with something else. And for Costa, either status uh, is um, mm, contributes to answer the question how theoretical symmetries relate to uh, phenomena and the world. So. Um, in this way, so if theoretical symmetries have either status, they acquire empirical significance because they are linked with phenomena, and they acquire ontological significance because they are linked with the world, because phenomena are the world. Uh, so, um, connecting this to Christian's talk, uh, so he was saying, um, he was raising doubts about whether the theoretical symmetries are connected to the world, whether they are real, before before the, uh, answer, asking the question whether they are fundamental, we should ask whether they are real, and uh, the way for theoretical, a way for theoretical symmetries to be real is for them to be connected to the world. So Kosso's uh, answer would be that, of course, theoretical symmetries are connected to the world, and here are two ways in which they are connected. But uh, uh, Christian was speaking about precise theoretical symmetries, which are symmetries of laws, uh, or equations, as I understand him, but uh, whether uh, those theoretical symmetries who have empirical status as symmetries of laws is one of the questions which was asked by the literature which followed from Kosso's article. So actually, uh, this literature, I start with the uh, top. Uh, so this literature was asking uh, different questions about direct empirical status, and as, as far as theoretical symmetries are concerned, uh, they were asking, for example, whether both internal and external theoretical symmetries have a direct empirical status. So whether both um, external means spatial temporal and internal means uh, non-spatial temporal. So whether both kinds of theoretical symmetries have direct empirical status, uh, Costa was answering affirmatively, and since then nobody has uh, said anything which would uh, 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 which would counter what he was saying. So. Uh, we think both kinds of symmetries have directly bigger status and so are related with the world and phenomena. Uh, but the, control, the main controversy of the research on directly bigger status for the last 20 years was whether uh, both global and local symmetries have uh, the status or only global symmetries have it. So the traditional position is uh, uh, only global symmetries have directly bigger status, but uh, Gibbs and Wallace were the first to defend that local symmetries also do it. And uh, the relevant distinction here uh, is between uh, roughly uniform and non-uniform, or uh, less roughly specified by parameters versus by functions. So translation.
uh, the global symmetry, for instance, and diffeomorphism is local, and uh, uh, gauge symmetry is local, and uh, potential shifts are global. So uh, my view is that local symptoms also have direct vehicle status, and this was the main idea of my PhD thesis defended uh, under the supervision of Alexander Gay. Uh, but then there is a third question about theoretical symmetries uh, having direct vehicle status, whether these are symmetries of laws or models. And uh, as I was saying, Christian uh, was concentrating on symmetries of laws, but uh, as to myself, uh, I am claiming that direct vehicle status uh, is a property of symmetries of models. And uh, there's a difference. In Christian's talk, it was uh, said that uh, if you have a symmetry of laws, then you can express it as a symmetry of models uh, in the sense of solutions of these laws. Mm, but the models I'm speaking here are not uh, the same, so um, mm, and the, so the symmetries are, do not coincide. So in my case, if you have symmetries of models so with direct empirical status, it's not necessarily the case that they correspond to some symmetries of laws uh, in the sense of equations, which also have their direct empirical status. So there is a dissociation because uh, uh, which works in either direction, actually. And uh, uh, the fact that I say that theoretical symmetries uh, have indirect empirical status are symmetries of models, it will help me in the following part of my talk, uh, uh, where I claim that the relationship between theoretical and physical symmetries uh, involved in direct empirical status is really direct uh, in the sense of not being mediated by anything. Uh, so this is conditional on my approach. Not everybody uh, could agree, but in my framework it works so, uh, and helps uh, me to construct the rest of my argument, which I will be presenting in, in, in a few slides. So this was uh, the theoretical side of uh, the literature on direct empirical status. As to the uh, physical side, uh, in the sense of uh, uh, in the sense of what concerns symmetries in the world. Uh, so, because um, um, uh, was not uh, clear enough about which uh, symmetries in the world should be matched with theoretical symmetries to get the direct empirical status, and this was made clear uh, subsequently. So, only this uh, next article by Braden and Brown uh, uh, gave uh, what became what uh, will uh, then become a paradigmatic example of uh, physical symmetry, uh, which yields uh, direct empirical status. This is an example of Galileo's ship. So the ship is uh, boosted with respect to the shore, but the dynamics inside observably is unchanged. So this is uh, a symmetry in the world, uh, observable symmetry, and uh, it corresponds to a theoretical boost on subsystems. Uh, so uh, this is how the latter theoretical symmetries get direct empirical status, because there is a, this Galileo ship symmetry in the world. And uh, Healy uh, said, introduced the notion of empirical symmetry and said that Galileo's ship is one case and uh, uh, Faraday's cage, uh, cage is another. And then there were two more added. And uh, so the, the kind of physical symmetry which gives rise to empirical, direct empirical status became uh, a very precise notion and still not uh, completely precise. So in my thesis, I tried to define it a bit better. Uh, it was still not achieved, but uh, partly achieved. So, uh, but it's not any physical symmetry which will do to get the direct empirical states. It's something very precise. Uh, but the upshot is that so far the literature has concentrated on just direct empirical status and on the kind of symmetries involved in it, but it, it uh, was not addressing actually uh, neither em uh, indirect empirical status, uh, which was also introduced, nor uh, conservation principles. So what are these? Uh, so to remind, uh, indirect empirical status was the correspondence between theoretical symmetries and some conservation laws, uh, by, in Costa's words. Uh, and a conservation principle is uh, my term to, to designate the correspondence between theoretical symmetries of actions and conservation laws. And it's not the just correspondence, it's actually an entailment. So theoretical symmetries entail conservation laws. They, uh, they can be used to derive them. And I ask, I um, call this conservation principle because um, because variational principles are something, it's a common name to designate uh, cases where you take symmetries of actions and you derive something from it. So if you derive conservation laws, I, I call this conservation principle. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the indirect empirical status is uh, very similar to conservation principle, and uh, you have a temptation to <laughs> compare the two and analyze them together. So, so this is what I will be doing. 
Uh, so I just uh, uh, a bit short of time. I just keep uh, uh, some details here. But the upshot is that uh, uh, symmetries and conservation laws are addressed, have been addressed in different contexts, uh, including recently. But these are not a question, a contexts where uh, symmetries and conservation laws are analyzed uh, uh, in light of this notion of indirect empirical status and in light of its relationship with direct empirical status. So this. Uh, what is missing in the literature is what I'm trying to do. So uh, here's what I say. Let's uh, see what conservation principles tell us about indirect empirical status and also direct empirical status. So on the left, you have uh, the usual presuppositions uh, in the literature, and then on the right, you have what I <laughs> will be transforming them into. So uh, usually it's uh, believed that uh, the distinction between the state direct and indirect empirical status is a binary distinction. So you just have two terms, uh, and I am claiming that this is a gradation. So that you have uh, many kinds of empirical statuses, uh, which are organized in a certain way from a weaker to stronger, for instance. And then the second claim is that so the second position is that conservation principles only yield indirect empirical status. And why it would be plausible? It could be plausible because, uh, as you saw, conservation principle is about conservation laws, and indirect empirical status is also about conservation laws. So it would be uh, quite natural to think that conservation principles only yield indirect empirical status. But I will claim that it also yields direct empirical status. So this will be the two claims which we will uh, uh, find. Uh, uh, in what follows, find demonstrated in what follows. Uh, so first, uh, first uh, to begin, we are approaching to the first claim. Uh, uh, but uh, as I said, uh, the, so, so uh, the usual one of the usual presuppositions is that conservation principles yield at least indirect empirical status. So how do we get at even this usual presupposition? This is not uh, uh, very trivial. Uh, so on the left we have conservation principle again, and on the right we have indirect empirical status. And in each, in each case we have theoretical. We begin with theoretical symmetries uh, for conservation principle. There are special symmetries. So Christian was saying about uh, laws, uh, about models, but uh, these are not the only things which can be invariant in your theory and which uh, consequently uh, can give rise to symmetries. Also actions which are specific uh, um, quantities, uh, they can also be invariant. Uh, so it is these specific symmetries which uh, you should uh, take uh, in the case of conservation principles. But this is a minor um, difference. Uh, a more important difference is that both conservation principles and uh, indirect empirical status are about conservation laws, but I'm claiming that these are not the same laws uh, because uh, on the conservation principle side, so on the left, uh, conservation laws should be theoretical because you are speaking about uh, a derivation of some result from something theoretical. So I argue that if uh, you derive something from something theoretical, then what you derive is also theoretical. So conservation laws involved in conservation principles should be theoretical. Uh, but if uh, you look at the right side, uh, then um, conservation laws, as I'm claiming, should be empirical and not theoretical. Why? Because, uh, as you recall, uh, because it is an empirical status, so it should be about something empirical. And if you compare this with direct empirical status here at the bottom uh, right, uh, you see that it is match, it is a match in between theoretical symmetries and the, what Costa was call, calling physical symmetries, but which was uh, got, uh, um, uh, it, it was made more precise, as I said, and it resulted in the empirical symmetries, the one which you can observe, for instance, as uh, Galileo ship. So if direct empirical status involves an, an, a match in between something theoretical and something empirical, then another empirical status, which is an indirect one, uh, should, as I claim, also involve something empirical besides something theoretical. And so conservation laws involved in the indirect empirical status should be empirical. So we have some mismatch between conservation principles where conservation laws are theoretical and indirect empirical status where conservation laws are empirical. However, it does not preclude us from getting uh, uh, the indirect empirical status from conservation principle. How does it happen? Uh, well, here is a, below is a combination of, uh, of both things. Uh, so uh, first I restrict theoretical symmetries to symmetries of actions. Uh, then I keep 
theoretical conservation laws, which are uh, deduced from theoretical symmetries by a conservation principle. And then I add empirical conservation laws to get the indirect empirical status. Uh, uh, so the point is that with conservation principle, you, ha you are half the road. So if you can construct some relationship between theoretical conservation laws and empirical conservation laws, the, then from a conservation principle, you can get uh, uh, and indirect empirical status. And I, I claim that this uh, relationship between theoretical conservation laws and empirical conservation laws can be easily constructed. This is just a relation of either representation or instantiation, depending uh, in which direction you go. So uh, this is how uh, briefly you get uh, indirect empirical status from conservation principle. Uh, but the thing is that uh, so far you have just got uh, something usual. Uh, so even uh, uh, you should understand that even this is not discussed in the literature because the literature concentrates on the direct empirical status. Uh, but it just presupposes that there is some uh, presupposes that there is some relationship between conservation principles and indirect empirical status. So even this uh, um, presupposition uh, had to be spelled out, and this is uh, what I have just uh, done. But uh, <clears throat> spelling this out, we just get some usual claim uh, demonstrated. But now let's get to my own claim, which are unusual. <clears throat> uh, so um, the first claim I was promising to uh, demonstrate was that uh, direct uh, the distinction between direct and indirect empirical status is not a binary distinction, it's a gradation. So there are many empirical statuses which are organized in some way. <clears throat> which are ordered. Uh, so uh, to get there, uh, let's compare indirect empirical status and direct empirical status. So indirect empirical status, as you have just saw, uh, saw uh, involves the following on the left. Uh, so you have theoretical symmetries of actions, then you get uh, to the, from there to theoretical conservation laws, and then you get, get from the latter to empirical conservation laws, and that's how you get an indirect empirical status, which obtains between your highest level and your lowest level, so between theoretical symmetries of actions and uh, empirical conservation laws. Now, if you compare this with direct empirical status on the right side, so you also find theoretical symmetries, uh, which are not uh, made precise here, but these are symmetries of specific models, as I was claiming before. And the, uh, on the bottom, you have empirical symmetries, which are also something specific. <clears throat> but, uh, uh, well, if you compare the, the left and the right, uh, um, you have some similarities, like theoretical symmetries upstairs and uh, empirical something uh, at the bottom. But you have a crucial difference, uh, I, I take it to be crucial, <clears throat> the difference is that on the left, you also have this middle level of theoretical conservation laws. So you have something in the middle between uh, between the, um, the the things which undertake this uh, uh, relationship of having uh, of uh, giving rise to an empirical status. So I uh, uh, I take this uh, <clears throat> this uh, middle term to be a characteristic of indirectness. So I claim that indirectness obtains precisely when there are these mediating theoretical elements like theoretical conservation laws in our example. And uh, once you uh, notice this, you can also uh, notice that uh, there can be some variation about this middle term. So here we have just one term, for example, but we could have several terms or we could have uh, uh, them placed on different levels uh, uh, and not on one level. So um, you, uh, once you uh, make the indirectness a function of uh, there being this mediating theoretical elements, you understand that indirectness can uh, also uh, obtained to different degrees, and consequently, the indirect empirical status is not just a single notion, it's a group of notions which differ by uh, the quantity of theoretical level, uh, elements which mediate uh, the connection between uh, the main elements, and uh, the, uh, which also differ by the uh, <clears throat> levels at which these mediating uh, elements are located. <clears throat> So once you get there, uh, uh, you already have uh, the indirect empirical status uh, transformed into a gradation. And consequently, the whole distinction is uh, between direct and indirect empirical status is transformed into a gradation because now instead of just two terms, you have many terms because of the indirect empirical status side. So this demonstrates the first of my claims, which I announced in the beginning. And now, uh, in the remaining time, uh, let's uh, get to the second claim. Uh, so now I just, uh, to do this, I just uh, showed two examples. 
The first is, lo uh, is long to construct and the second is very short. Uh, so now I'm just, uh, uh, there will be several slides that each uh, serves to, uh, to advance uh, by one stage. So I take several stages in this way and I get my example. Uh, so first example, first stage, uh, nuance in conservation principles. Uh, so I begin with, uh, on the left, uh, with uh, the usual uh, conservation principle. Uh, so there you have uh, uh, um, theoretical symmetries of actions at the top, uh, empirical conservation laws at the bottom, and in the middle you have just one element, theoretical conservation laws, the mediating element which gives indirectness, which is will give indirectness. Uh, so nuancing consists in that I just Instead of having just one element, I have two elements located at different levels. So now I have differential on the right, differential conservation laws and integral conservation laws. And I just, I, it's not myself who took this from nowhere. Actually, the real conservation principles like those uh, which uh, we get from Mercer's theorems, uh, they are like what you see on the right. So the left uh, picture, the left scheme is just a simplification of what we usually have and the right scheme is a, a more correct one. So in real life, you have two levels of conser theoretical conservation laws. Uh, that's uh, what I'm saying here. Uh, now, uh, the second stage, uh, I extend um, the matching empirical elements beyond symmetries. So if you, on the left, you have direct empirical status and uh, what you notice is that at the bottom level, so at the empirical level, uh, the empirical thing is a symmetry. And uh, what you notice at the right uh, is just the same uh, nuanced uh, statement of conservation principles as before, which give ri gives rise to, uh, to an index empirical status as before. And what you notice here is that uh, uh, at the bottom you have something empirical as well, but these are not symmetries, strictly speaking, at least not empirical symmetries in the sense of those involved in direct empirical status, but these are just, uh, these are conservation laws instead. So uh, the difference, uh, so the thing, uh, just to repeat, uh, in the direct empirical status, at the empirical level you have symmetries uh, at the bottom, and um, in the indirect empirical status of the kind we are considering, uh, at the bottom you have no symmetries but conservation laws. Uh, so the upshot is that when you have an indirect empirical status, Koso was saying that this was something about symmetries, but actually this can be something about not only symmetries but also conservation laws, at least on the empirical level. But if at the empirical level you um, you make this extension, so you are considering not only symmetries but also conservation laws, then why not also make it at the theoretical level? So this is precisely what I do at the next slide. So on the left you have uh, the same picture as before, and on the right you have uh, the same scheme, and on the right you have also the same scheme, except that I now put accent on something else. So as I was saying, if uh, uh, the, if an empirical status can obtain between not only symmetries and symmetries, but also between symmetries and conservation laws, so why not also make it obtain between conservation laws and conservation laws? That's precisely what I'm uh, doing at the right uh, scheme. So I, uh, consequence, uh, uh, this differential theoretical conservation laws, which you were considering as a mediating element with respect to the indirect empirical status of symmetries of actions, now they get their own empirical, indirect empirical status because we have lifted the requirement that uh, empirical status is obtained just between symmetries. We said they can also obtain between conservation laws. So now actually you have two indirect empirical statuses. So one is for symmetries of actions on the left and another is for, for conservation laws on the differential theoretical conservation laws on the right. So actually in the same, uh, Mm, uh, newest conservation principle, you will now have two indirect empirical statuses. And this is what is summarized here. Uh, so uh, the same empirical conservation laws are linked with differential theoretical conservation laws and they are linked with theoretical symmetries of actions. And in either case, you have an instance of indirect empirical status. And of course, uh, the, uh, the upper uh, element, the theoretical symmetries of action has a more indirect status because there are more theoretical elements in between. And the differential theoretical conservation laws have a, a less indirect status, but still indirect one because there are still inter in 
uh, how it's called, uh, integral service code conservation laws in the middle. So they are made to demonstrate that they are also a direct empirical status in this case, and this is very easy. So once we co um, compare our pre previous scheme with uh, the scheme of, of uh, direct empirical status, so the previous is on the left and direct empirical status is on the right, uh, you notice that we have an analog of the right scheme on the left, Namely, uh, so we seek for a relationship where there are no mediating elements, and we find it uh, on the left between integral theoretical conservation laws and empirical conservation laws. So this uh, distinction, uh, this relationship I claim is an instance of direct empirical status. And that's how we get the gradation of empirical statuses involving direct and the indirect ones uh, in the same example of uh, conservation principles. So this demonstrates my second claim. Uh, and, uh, which, uh, which was saying that we also have direct empirical status in this case, and uh, this demonstrates a further claim by which, uh, as mentioned, uh, conservation principles uh, give rise to a gradation of empirical status, since, uh, which include direct and indirect empirical uh, ones. And uh, here's the penultimate slide. Uh, so once we have finished with this, we can actually do the same elsewhere. So uh, here's my second example. Uh, uh, which is just one slide. So on the left, you have uh, conservation uh, principles with all the statuses that they have established so far. And on the right, you have uh, in the black, uh, uh, the usual direct empirical uh, status. But now if we reason analogically, then uh, we should expect there to be higher theoretical elements which give rise to the theoretical uh, symmetries so which have direct empirical status, but these higher elements will have indirect empirical status and we also will have a gradation in this case. Uh, so uh, my approach generates this prediction. Uh, conclusions, uh, sorry for being a bit late. Um, so direct and indirect empirical statuses are worth being analyzed together and not separately, uh, and actually only direct empirical status is analyzed in the literature, but I say we should analyze both and together. And uh, conservation principles provide a fruitful context of study because uh, you will find both, uh, you will find out interesting things about both statuses there and uh, you will get some prediction. Uh, so, uh, indirectness of an empirical status is a function of mediating theoretical elements. These elements uh, may vary in quantity and level, uh, therefore the indirect empirical status is, is a gradation and therefore the whole direct and direct empirical status distinction is also a gradation. If you add to this that matching elements are not necessarily of uh, involved in an empirical status are not necessarily symmetries, then you get that conservation principles exemplify this gradation of empirical statuses, and moreover that the usual example of direct empirical status should give rise to another such gradation. So the usual example is just the tip of an iceberg. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> so, is there some questions? You can raise your hand if you if you don't have access to this feature on your on your computer. Let me know. So, is there questions for both of of our speakers? Okay. So, Patricia Palacios first. Mm -hmm, thank you. So, thank you, Valeria, for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, I, I have first a clarificatory question, so I'm glad that you distinguish between different kinds of symmetries because I also think that not all, not all symmetries are symmetries of laws. So, but can you explain a little bit more what you mean by symmetries of models? So do you mean that the model, the whole model remains invariant under transformation or certain properties of the model quantities, for example, remain invariant under transformation? Uh, yes, thank you for the question and for listening. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, so the models uh, can be different. Uh, uh, some models are complicated, so you have many features there. And uh, what I mean by symmetry is that 
part of these features is preserved. Uh, sometimes it's said that uh, some whole thing should be preserved for this to count as a symmetry. For instance, if we have symmetry of flow in the sense of equation, so uh, we think that the, the form of equation should be preserved uh, for it to be a, a symmetry. So in the case of, uh, for us to get a symmetry of uh, this equation, in the case of models, uh, I admit that just part of the model should be preserved. Why I do this? Because this is um, this matches well with the kind of situation we have in uh, the case of direct empirical status. Because, uh, for instance, in the example of Galileo's ship, the ship is boosted and the dynamics inside the ship uh, stays observably the same. So uh, the full situation includes both what is happening within the ship and what is happening uh, uh, with the relationship between the ship and the shore. I claim that this relationship should be represented in theory. So in the model, you will have some part of your model which is responsible for representing this relationship. And the boosting of the physical ship will change this part of the model, so you will not have a perfect symmetry of your uh, model in the sense it will not be co a complete symmetry. But I insist that this uh, change is necessary because it will uh, uh, help you to um, account for the fact that you have a different physical situation before boosting the ship than uh, uh, afterwards. So this is a kind of uh, symmetry of model um, which I claim is involved in the direct empirical status case. Uh, so this symmetry uh, is a partial symmetry, uh, but it preserves uh, uh, that part of the model which is responsible for uh, describing what is within the ship. Yeah, thank you. That's, it. That's exactly what I thought. Thanks. Well, thank you. Okay, Davide Romano, your question? Uh, yes, uh, I have a question for uh, uh, Valeria and then also for Christian, if there is time. Uh, so the one for Valeria is, uh, is very naive because I'm not, not really an expert on this field. And I wanted to ask an, an example of the indirect empirical status of asymmetry. So I understand that there is some respect to the direct uh, symmetry. There are some levels and entities that mediate the symmetry. Uh, I, I was curious about one concrete example. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David, for listening and for the question. Uh, so I was speaking about conservation principles in general. So each such conservation principle give rise, uh, gives rise to an interactive vehicle status. And the concrete examples are just these principles where you fill in concrete symmetries of actions and uh, you get concrete conservation laws. So, uh, so uh, if so, all the conservation laws, you know, like conservation of charge, of momentum, uh, whatever, uh, the center of mass motion, they all. Uh, um, can, well, usually they can all be derived from some symmetries of uh, actions. Uh, so if you have a relevant theory like uh, electromagnetism, you should have some action where um, the electromagnetic field uh, figures and uh, you make it vary under um, transformations of uh, electromagnetic potential and you get uh, conservation uh, of charge uh, if you apply Noether's theorem. So uh, this is one example, and you get all the uh, conservation laws of special relativity by varying uh, suitable actions. You also get them in general relativity. Okay. Thank, thank you, Valeria. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I understand. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, my, my second question was uh, was for Christian. Uh, I I don't see Christian, but okay, <laughs> I try to make the question. Um, the, so I start from the, the observation that you made on the, uh, the symmetry, the symmetry by stipulation uh, of the guiding law uh, in Bohm's theory. Um, so that's, that's interesting because in that book, uh, the, the Galilean symmetry is, is, um, is done by stipulation. That means they derive the equation that depends on the parameter alpha and by stipulating that there is a Galilean symmetry, they found that alpha is h over m, uh, and this is the correct parameter for, for the guiding law. Uh, the, uh, the, this case is interesting because, uh, first of all, it was criticized in a paper by Harvey Brown, 
Uh, and Arvi Brown in the paper say explicitly that uh, you cannot derive a dynamical law uh, from a, a by stimulation symmetry. So I don't know if uh, I don't know if Christian uh, faced this uh, <laughs> this paper. I can send it to him. Uh, and uh, also, uh, it's even more interesting because in another paper, Anthony Valentini showed that Bohm's theory is not Galilean invariant. So there is no agreement <clears throat> on the fact that uh, the guiding law is uh, Galilean, sorry, <clears throat> is Galilean invariant. Um, the way in which Valentini <clears throat> derived, I think, is not by stipulation, but uh, a posteriori. So it seems that, you know, they really do not agree uh, that Bohm's theory is Galilean invariant. So for, for Dur, by stipulation it is, and for Valentini, a posteriori doesn't. And <laughs> so I think this uh, makes even more interesting this, uh, this case. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the, the, this is the observation and the question uh, the, or the consideration was uh, if you think, okay, the by stipulation law in some way uh, must be confirmed then by some feature of the theory, for example, empirical, fe empirical feature of the theory. Uh, okay, thanks, David, for, for, for the observation of the comment. Uh, first, let me say something about the, the, the observation because what, what you said is very, very interesting because if, if I remember correctly, what Valentini uh, finally says is that uh, you will end up with a sort of Aristotelian space or something li like that because precisely the dynamics doesn't meet the required for the Galilean symmetry. So you will end up with a different um, underlying space, like more like an Aristotelian space and not a Galilean space. But I, I think that what, what I would say is, is, is obviously interesting because, I mean, for me, they are departing from different uh, starting points. I mean, if, if, if you look at one, one, one way to say that uh, the uh, identity criterion to for a theory is the kind of symmetries that it meets. You can say, well, Galile uh, quantum mechanic must be uh, must be uh, Galilean invariant. So if you come up with a theory that is non Galilean invariant, so it's not quantum mechanics. And I think that. Many people, like, I don't know, uh, if you read Valentine's book, I, I think that they have this intuition behind that, well, this is the right group of theory, the, the right symmetry group of the theory. If you come up with something different, it's no longer quantum mechanics, for example. But again, they, they are assuming, they are stipulating that, well, the space time is more or less like Galilean space time, so the symmetries should be the Galilean symmetries. There is this connection, and then the dynamic just emerge from, from there. But if you change the starting point, well, you will end up with a different theory. And I think that uh, wave function, uh, uh, wave function realism is is uh, no Galilean invariant either. Uh, I think that uh, Alori shows showed this. Um, but also, I mean, it, again, we we are discussing more or less the same thing. And sure. as 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 to the question, um, please. Can you repeat the question because I forgot it? Uh, no, no, it's just, you know, that uh, if I do, if I implement a by stipulation symmetry, uh, do you think then, then I must have a control on the symmetry that I have imposed on param some, uh, yeah. you know, feature that does not depend from the stipulation that I've done? Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, this is my, my, my 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 answer. I, I think it has two sides. The first side is well, of, of course, what you want is a dynamics that is empirically adequate. So, if if the symmetry um, if the symmetry if the symmetry the, the, the symmetry group, or for example, uh, promote promotes or helps you to build a particular dynamic that comes to be empirically adequate, uh, uh, work very well. Well, I mean. There are some constraints of, of the symmetry. There are some 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 feature the symmetry should meet because you want the, the, the theory to be empirically adequate after, after all. So this is the, my conservative answer. So there, there is some constraint. 
but the, 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 my, my, my second part of the answer is that, well, I mean, there are many cases in which you want a theory to be symmetric, and when you apply a transformation that you think that is intuitively true, you will not, you end up with a theory that is not symmetric as you you, you thought before. Uh, so the, what, what you usually what you usually do is to change the symmetry transformation, and there there is complete liberty to to change the symmetry transformation at will. And sorry for 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 repeat myself, but if you think of how time reversal symmetry is defined in quantum mechanics, you see that okay, I mean. You start with some idea about what quantum what time reversal is in classical mechanics. When would you apply the same transformation in, in, in quantum mechanics? Well, the theory is no longer uh, time reversal invariant. So you have to figure out what is the transformation that keeps the theory time reversal invariant. So in that case, there are some people that think that, well, you can always come up with a way to change the transformation in such a way that the theory is kept is kept uh, invariant under the transformation. Uh, so in that sense, well, I mean, there is there seems to be no strong constraint under by I mean not a very strong constraint about what symmetries are uh, 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 should be met or shouldn't be met. Uh, you can always play with a. We, we can come up with a mathematical transformation that keeps the theory invariant and call it. Well, this is the right transformation that represents space translation. This is the right transformation that represents. Uh, I don't know. Uh, time reversal. Okay. Thank you. Now, Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Okay. I think Christian, Christian, you had the question for Valeria. Uh, yes. Yes, I have a couple of questions for Valeria. Uh, well, my my I mean my first question is more or less related to Patricia's, so but probably you can explain it, explain it a little bit further because it's the difference between symmetries of laws and symmetries of models. Uh, I mean, I mean, obviously that there is some symmetries of models, um, but it's not clear to me if they are completely independent of the symmetries of laws. In some sense, when you have some model of the theory and you want to transform the, the model, is already a symmetry of the laws behind that guarantee that you can get a, a, you can get to the different model that is, a, is the symmetry transform model. So as, as I see the, the, the issue is that there is a difference, but the difference is just the, the symmetry of laws comes first in the sense that it gives you what is it, the dynamics of your model plus some uh, this is the, the, what we said, the symmetry of models. Then, when you put some initial conditions, some sort of boundary conditions, you get your model. But if the model is symmetric or not, will depend on the on the laws on the first hand, but also on the boundary condition and the initial conditions. So, for me, as, as, as I see it, uh, the symmetry of models com, comes after the symmetry of law or depends on the symmetry of laws. But I, I, I'm not really sure about this, but I, I would like to hear you, your thoughts about, about this, this point. And just briefly, the, the, my, my second question probably is quite silly, but I don't really get what is an empirical symmetry. What, what, what they mean by empirical symmetry? For me, in the case of Galileo's ship, I, I, I don't see what is the empirical part, if, if, if you put it in this, uh, in this plain sense, uh, because if, if you want to get a symmetry from the Galilean ship, you have to at least idealize the rest of the of the environment that is interacting with the ship. Because if I not idealize the rest of the environment, I can always say that obviously I can realize perfectly well that I'm seeing the shore moving. So obviously there's no uh, symmetry. So there's something else that is not empirical to get to these empirical symmetries. In this case, some idealization that take off the interactions with, with the ships. Uh, thank you for the questions. Um, I hope I will not forget the different details because there are many things to answer in what you were <laughs> sorry, saying sorry. about. Uh, okay, so let's uh, begin with the first. Um, 
You were saying that uh, whether something is a symmetry of models is determined by uh, laws. Uh, this is not the case in the uh, context of direct empirical status, because in my approach, um, different uh, models um, are symmetric if they uh, represent uh, different uh, states of the uh, sh ship involved in an empirical symmetry. Uh, so what determines whether uh, models are symmetric is uh, the re representation relationship between them and uh, the, uh, sh uh, the um, empirical symmetry. So this relationship uh, is a uh, like bottom <laughs> level relationship. It does not involve uh, laws, uh, uh, does not necessarily involve laws. Uh, so why uh, do I think uh, that this relationship uh, is uh, dissociated from symmetry uh, and uh, the, the symmetry of models which is induced by this relationship? So why do I think that this symmetry of models is dissociated from uh, any symmetries of laws? This is uh, because um, the symmetries uh, which represent different states of the um, empirical symmetry so the theoretical, sorry, the theoretical models which represent different states uh, involved in an empirical symmetry and which are related by a symmetry of models. So these states can be generated by different laws. So uh, if you take a uh, Hopkins literal empirical symmetry, uh, where uh, in the first, uh, in the initial state of your empirical symmetry, you don't have electromagnetism, uh, you have your solenoid turned off. And in the um, final state of your empirical symmetry, you have a solenoid turned on. So in this final state, uh, it is natural to represent it uh, with a model which belongs to some theory which has electromagnetism in it. And it is also natural to represent the initial state of this uh, the empirical symmetry, which uh, does not have the solenoid turned on, uh, with a model which belongs to a theory which does not have an electromagnetism in it. So in this case, uh, these models, uh, which uh, one of which you get from a theory without electromagnetism, and another you get from a theory with electromagnetism, these models will be related by a symmetry of models because they will represent a symmetry in their world. Uh, uh, that holds nuclear vehicle symmetry. But these models will be generated using different theories, and these theories have different uh, laws, different equations. So uh, there will be no corresponding symmetry of laws because uh, you will get, when you get from one model to another, you get from one kind of laws without electromagnetism to another kind of laws with electromagnetism, with electromagnetic potential figure in your equations. Mm -hmm. So this is a dissociation of the two. And you can have the converse uh, symmetry breaking is the converse uh, where you have symmetry of force, which is not a symmetry of models uh, of specific models. So, um, and uh, your second question, uh, now I forgot a bit, but um, what was it about? Yeah, it was about, was about the, the, the notion of empirical in the empirical symmetries. In, in yes, yes, uh, uh, idealizations. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, you're supposed, it seems like you're supposed that we should abstract away what, happen, what happens with the environment to get the empirical symmetry in the case of Kardashian. Well, actually, uh, some person, uh, uh, rare persons do this, he does this, for instance, but usually uh, those who write on direct empirical status do not abstract away what is happening with the environment, and I think they are making it right. Why? Because if you abstract away which happens, what happens with the environment, then you have no reason to uh, affirm that, uh, that any transformation happened with your ship. But if you want to have a real symmetry in the world, you need to have some real transformation which, uh, which preserves some uh, observable or at least uh, uh, worldly features. So if uh, you just concentrate on the ship, uh, then you have no difference between the uh, ship before and after the boost because uh, the relationship with the environment is upset in a way. So this, you can claim that this is not a symmetry, this is just the same state repeated twice, instantiated twice. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so uh, I think that uh, the relationship with the environment in the Galileo ship case is essential to saying that you have an empirical symmetry rather than the same state incident twice. advice. So uh, you do not need to abstract it away and uh, you uh, therefore um, get what, what, what I was uh, uh, mentioning when answering to Patricia's question. So you also have at the theoretical level that your symmetry is only partial because uh, also at the empirical level it is partial. The, what happens with the environment is changed, but what happens within the ship is preserved. 
this is an empirical symmetry. It's empirical because it's in the world that it is symmetry because what is inside the ship is not changed and it is a partial symmetry because we do need to keep the relationship with the environment as this relationship changes. Okay, thanks for the, I, I think that we, we don't have time, right? For uh, yeah, we, we don't have much time. Okay, sorry. Sorry, uh, okay, so yeah. thank you very much for, for the, for the uh, answers. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I don't know what the Rabat was. Uh, sorry, uh, Patricia was uh, wanted to ask something, but first Rabat was uh, wanted no, to ask. No, no, no. Rabat said that uh, his question was already answered. Okay, good. Then just Patricia, maybe. Yeah. I just wanted to add some, something to what Valeria said, but I don't know if there is enough time. Last question. Yeah, yeah. it's just it's a remark. Actually, it's not a question. It's very small. So I, I agree with. Valeria, I, I don't think that all symmetries are symmetries of law. So you can also think about symmetries of quantities. So quantities might be invariant under some transformation. For example, magnetization at a very low temperature, at very high temperature, might, it can be invariant under up-down symmetry. And I don't see how you can relate that necessarily, or why should you relate that necessarily to a law? So I completely agree with Valeria in that in that in that sense. I don't think all symmetries are symmetries of loss. Oh, sorry, your your microphone. Uh, can I reply, or uh, we are out of time? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I can I can close the discussion. You you if Christian, you said that all good symmetries are symmetries of loss. It's obviously wrong. But on the no, other no, hand. Yeah. You follow John Ehrman, you follow all these guys, and they say that all this very important symmetry that we are discussing are symmetries of dynamics. So something like that. But we won't stop the discussion about that now. And it's already <laughs> almost uh, 1800 hours. So I would propose to postpone these discussion to a future okay. scenario. If, okay, thank you very much, everybody. Okay, okay. So, there. <laughs> so I will thank all the speakers and all the people that ask good questions to these speakers. And hopefully next time we won't have the presentation of the stuffed people and old people and it will be only scientific. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. And thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.